All right, this is concept two notes, and we are going to talk about movement. It's kind of going to serve as a bridge between our skeletal system notes in concept one and covering the muscular system in concept three. So we're not going to cover movement in its entirety. We're going to talk about the details of muscle contractions in concept three. We're going to talk about kind of an overview of movements here just to kind of get us ready for that. So what do I mean? Most important thing we're going to be talking about are your joints or articulations. That's another word for joint is an articulation. And joints are simply the meeting places between two or more bones. They give your skeleton mobility and they hold it together. Body movements happen when muscles contract across your joints, moving one bone toward another. Important connective tissues that are involved in joints are your ligaments, which attach bones to bones, and your tendons, which attach muscles to bones, which we talked about in our skeletal system discovery stations when we labeled our big body diagrams, but had to bring them up again. <clears throat> bones allow us to move, but they can't move without muscles and joints because our bones are static. So joints and these connective tissues, and of course our muscles are so, so, so important. And we can, we can classify them two ways, structurally or functionally. So we're going to talk about the functional classification first. Functional classification of joints is based on what the joint does and how much movement the joint allows. In general, the less movable the joint, the more stable it is. And why does that make sense? Well, think of some of the joints in your body. If you're not sure where they are, think about where at least two bones meet and you have movement. So think about like your shoulders, for instance. You can do a lot of movements with your arms at your shoulder joints. So because it's very movable, it's less stable. It's Think about how easy it is to dislocate your shoulder. Whereas there are joints in your skull that you may not even know about because they don't really move at all. And those are incredibly stable, which is a good thing because I don't really think I want the bones in my skull moving around very much. So <clears throat> it's a relationship that makes sense. Let's talk about the three types of functional classification. So first, we have a synarthrosis joint, or plural is synarthroses. These are non-moving joints. Thus, they're the most stable. Example, these are the parts of your skull that protect the brain. So we saw in our skeletal system there are, you know, many bones in your skull, but the ones that are specifically over your brain are your cranial bones, or they're covering your cranium. Those are the joints between those, where those bones meet, are synarthroses. Amphiarthroses, or amphiarthrosis for a singular, are slightly moving joints. So this is where like your pubic bones meet in your pelvis. They can move a little, just a little bit. And then there are the diarthroses, or diarthrosis for a singular. And these are your freely moving joints. These are the least stable, but they provide the most movement. So these would be like the joints in your knee or your elbow, mainly your limb joints, because those are the ones that need to be moving the most freely. <clears throat> All right, structural classification. This is based on what is being bound together. So what bones are we binding together in the joint and if a cavity is present or not. And there are three types of structural classification as well. So fibrous joints connect bones with the collagen fibers of dense connective tissue. And they are mostly immovable. So, for instance, these are like your bones in your skull. They're held together by fibrous joints, which we specifically call sutures. Now, remember, since they're immovable, most of these are considered to be synarthroses. So, <clears throat> there's some overlap here. Every joint can be classified structurally or functionally, or and functionally. Another example, um, your fibula and your tibia that are in your lower leg are held together by ligaments only. That's what's connecting them. And they are fibrous joints called that we refer to as syndesmoses, or a syndesmosis would be the individual or the singular. Another is the way that your teeth are embedded in their sockets. It's a fibrous joint that um, you can't really see in this picture, but the plural, these fibrous joints are called gumphoses. 
Another type are your cartilaginous joints. These are connecting your bones with cartilage, and they can be rigid but slightly movable. So an example that is not movable at all, it's, it, it's totally immovable, is um, <clears throat> in your sternum and the very first rib right there. That's an immovable joint. There's a bar or you could say a plate of hyaline cartilage between your sternum and your first rib, and that's called a synchondrosis. Another cartilaginous joint, but it's slightly movable, are these fibrocartilaginous intervertebral discs that are between your vertebrae that act as shock absorbers. Um, that joint is a symphysis. And there's another one in your pubic arch where the two sides of the pubic bones attach. So those are examples of cartilaginous joints. And then we have your synovial joints. And this is where we're going to spend the most of our time today because these provide the most movement. And this is a concept on movement. So your synovial joints connect bones with the dense connective tissues and a fluid-filled joint cavity. So that's what distinguishes them from the other two. So there's this joint cavity between the two bones that has this kind of lubricating fluid. It allows them to be freely movable, so all of our synovial joints are also diarthroses. And they have six special features, which we're going to talk about. So one is articular cartilage. So the opposing bone surfaces here have articular cartilage around them. We also have this joint or articular cavity. And we have a fibrous joint or articular capsule that encloses the cavity. So that's what we can see also pictured here. Three more special features. We have the synovial fluid that is in the cavity. Um, that's our lubricant here. And we have band-like ligaments that are reinforcing the cavity um, there. And then we also have some here. And then there are, of course, like we have within our bones, also in our joints, there are sensory nerve fibers and blood vessels, um, which are really, really important when we get to talking about muscle contraction in concept three. And then we have six types of configurations that we're going to talk about, too, of these synovial joints. There are some other structures that are associated with synovial joints, um, like bursae and tendon sheaths, but they can also be found elsewhere. They're not um, specific only to synovial joints. They're basically like bags of lubricant that help reduce friction when the joint's in motion. Um, so I didn't highlight them here because they're not specific just to synovial joints. Um, but those are the six that are unique just to synovial. And now we're going to talk through each of the different kinds of configurations and the movements that they allow in these configurations. So first are gliding joints or plane joints. They allow gliding movements. So that is when one flat bone surface glides or slips over another. So it's back and forth or side to side. So think at your wrist when you wave your hand, that's a gliding movement that's happening. So an example of where this joint type of joint is, is in your wrist, in your intercarpal joints, and then in your intertarsal joints in your ankle as well. Hinge joints. These only move in one direction, just like a door hinge. That's how I remember those. And they allow angular movements like flexion and extension. So flexion is when we bend in a way that decreases the angle of the joint so that the articulating bones, the two bones that are in the joint, are getting closer. So think about when you do a bicep curl. Okay, that's flexion. When you bring the curl in, like your hand towards your shoulder, Okay, that's decreasing the angle of that joint. So that's flexion. Or think, when you bend your head towards your chest, that's flexion as well. Extension is just the opposite. So when you lift your head back up or you release the bicep curl. And then hyperextension is what some people are able to do, is where they're able to allow the joint to go past the anatomical position. So past where it basically started. And so we, these types of joints, these... Hinge joints are in your elbow and then your interphalangeal or your finger joints. Pivot joint. At a pivot joint, rotation is allowed as well as twisting movements back and forth. 
Um, those types of twisting movements are supination and pronation. So supination, you're turning and twisting forward um, to face anteriorly, and then pronation, you're turning and twisting backward or to face posteriorly. An example of where this type of joint exists is where the humerus meets the radius and ulna at the elbow. All right, your condylar joint. Um, some people have a different name for this one, but we're going to do what's in the Mary B textbook, and that's condylar. So this is like a pedestal with a joint on top. It allows movements like flexion and extension, which we talked about with the bicep curl, as well as movements called abduction and adduction. So abduction is moving away. It's moving a limb away from the median plane along the frontal plane. So like if you have your arms down at your sides and you lift them upward, um, kind of to like make a cross shape with your body, the, that raising of your arms would be abduction. And then moving those arms back towards your body, the opposite of abduction would be adduction. So putting your arms back down would be adduction. And these condylar joints are, um, one place that they are, are in your wrist. And how you can kind of flex your wrist or move your wrist there. I shouldn't say flex, but abduct and adduct your wrist there. All right, let's talk about a saddle joint. These allow opposition movements as well as flexion, extension, and abduction and adduction. And this is what is in your thumb that makes your thumb special and opposable is that you can kind of fold it in there like when you're doing a number four or how you can touch your fingertip to each, uh, um, each fingertip to your thumb. That's because of that saddle joint there. All right, and then your ball and socket. This allows so much maneuverability. You can do rotational movements, abduction and adduction, like we did when we were lifting our arms, the flexion and extension. <clears throat> that rotation is just the turning of your bone around its own long axis. Um, and these are your shoulder and your hip joints. So there are many other types of movements and um, at different joints. There's like so many different joints that are specialized. We're just kind of focusing on these six main ones, but I do want to talk to you about some other types of movements because that abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, rotation, those aren't just the only types of movements your body can do. There's circumduction, which is moving your limb in a circle, like if you're making circles with your arms. There's elevation and depression, like lifting and then lowering your body part superiorly, so like shrugging your shoulders or allowing your jaw to drop, now, the dropping and then the lifting, the depression and elevation. There's protraction and retraction, like if you stick your jaw out to make an underbite or to frown and then pull it back in. There's dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, which are in your foot specifically, where you lift your foot up and down at your ankle. Lastly, inversion and aversion. This would be turning your foot towards the midline of the body versus turning away from the midline of the body. This is often what will happen when people will sprain an ankle. It will be because of one of these types of movements. So this is the briefest big picture overview of muscle contraction. We are going to spend much more time on this in concept three, but I wanted to enter. I can't talk about movement without talking about a muscle contraction. So your bones can't move without the joints that are connecting them, but they also can't move without the muscles that are stretching over those joints. And movement occurs when muscles contract. Muscles always pull, they never push. And that's going to be something we'll repeat over and over. And we have two main types of muscle contraction on a big picture scale. We have isotonic, which are muscle contractions that cause a change in the length of the muscles. So like lifting a box or doing a push-up like we see here. As she, you know, bends her arms so she can go down and then come back up, that's an isotonic movement. The length of her muscle is changing as she's moving. But sometimes you do isometric move contractions, and these require no change in length. So just standing and holding good posture, your body is in a muscle contraction to maintain that good posture, even though you're not moving. And holding a plank, that's an isometric contraction. All right, last little thing about muscle contraction I want to mention, which again, super brief, we'll talk about them more, but is this idea of insertion and origin. So we talked about a joint is where two bo bones are connecting. And in a muscle contraction, one bone is often being brought closer to another bone um, when something moves, like in a bicep curl. And so the movable bone 
during the muscle contraction is the insertion. And then the bone that is not moving or is moving much less is the origin. So for example, in a bicep curl, your radius is the insertion point and it pulls towards your scapula, or excuse me, your scapula, <clears throat> which is the origin, um, which we can see in this picture. So that's kind of what's happening here. Um, it's also pulling towards your humerus too, um, which it's connected to. So you could say those are both points of origin. So that's something we're going to keep bringing up as we look at different joints. And then we talk more about muscle contraction is this idea of the origin and the insertion. And that is our overview of movement.